Remember that one? Rejoice, rejoice in the Lord, Lord always. always. And again, I say rejoice. Awesome. I love hearing all those voices at the same time. Great. How about this one? And if Christ has not been risen, preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Yeah, we talked about that. Here's today's. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts or ruins good morals. Yeah, can you say it again? Do not be deceived. Ruins good morals. All right, very good, very good. Watch out who you hang out with. It makes a difference in your life, guys. And you can become so attached. I've seen this happen before. So attached to a person that you want to please them more than anything, more than the Lord even, and you'll start doing things that you'll later regret. It happens a lot to adults as well as kids. It's not just a kid thing. We've got to be careful who, we, who our best friends are. Okay. Um, and I, I already talked to you a while ago about the King James words, didn't I? Uh, you know, communications, bad, evil communications, really the Greek means bad company. Good manners, the Greek means good morals. But in King James' day, these words meant differently than they do today. So we talked about that already. Okay, is there anything else you want to mention before I pray today? Oh, good. So it's healing up a little bit. But it was his knee. Is that right? It was his knee that was hurt. Yeah. Okay, we'll keep praying for him. Anything else? Ready to pray for a minute? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these kids. Thank you for this time we have together. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we get to look at your word here. And, and I know they've already looked at it, almost all of them, in the earlier class today. But I thank you that you've warned us and reminded us that we need to be careful who we hang out with. We need to be careful who our best friends are. We need to make sure that we're hanging out with people that love Jesus and people that have the same uh, attitude about you and your word and the world we're living in that we do so that we can encourage each other. Lord, you know we're living in very difficult times, uh, very confusing times, and many, many people have rejected you. Many, many people have rejected your word and your truth and they want to act like it's all right, and they want to act like if we don't agree with them, then there's something wrong with us. But Lord, I pray you would help us to keep our focus on you and your word and your truth and not be deceived by these people who are embracing sin and calling it good and normal. So help us, Lord, to realize how bad that is and help us to keep our focus on you and to stand firm in your word. I pray you'd uh, help these kids today to learn a little bit more about your word as we study together this, the New Testament. I think we're in the book of Mark still, and I pray that you'd be our teacher. We thank you for your word. We know your word is powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. Your word changes our lives. It accomplishes what you send it to accomplish. So help us to grow stronger in Jesus as we read your word today and think about your word today and talk about it. So be in charge of us now and get glory through us. And Lord, I want to pray for Via's dad that you continue to heal that knee. I thank you that he's doing better for what the healing you've already done, but I pray you'd complete that process and that very soon he'd be back to normal and that you'd uh, take away pain, give him relief. And uh, thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All righty. Um, now let's see. Let me make sure I'm going to tell you the right thing. Here, let me look at my... Yeah, so this, is, this is Thursday. So next time on Tuesday, we will have a test over Mark already. So I want to, uh, let's see, let me back this up. I want to uh, kind of hit the high points again. Now, now guys, uh, let's see, I got to slide 22. Because we're having the test, Let's see. I, you got handouts, right? Everybody got the handouts? You got your handout? You're in, in here. You really ought to have your handouts with you because that's what I test you over. So when you come in here, you ought to get that out really quickly and be ready to use it. Uh, I know that some of you can remember maybe almost everything I tell you to remember on the test, and you'll be fine. But some of you, when you try to do that, you don't do fine. <laughs> you blow it. And you've got to, you, I would suggest very strongly that you mark those things. When I tell you it's going to be on the test, 
that you mark it and be so be ready for the to, to do that on the test. Okay. Can you, uh, bring that over here? What's that? The backpack. You can't. Yeah. Is that, this yours? Yes. Going up on here. Yeah. Um. A lot of these things, I circle the whole block because everything in there is important. And so you need to, I'm telling you guys, you need to be able to ask yourself some questions and, and not look at the answers. You know, see, if you can, see if you can remember the answer without looking at it. You, you, I'm not going to give you the answers on the test and say, do you think this is right? <laughs> You're going to have to come up with it yourself. Some of the tests that we'll take later on, some of them will be multiple choice and things like that. I mean, yeah, there's some matching and stuff like that. But, uh, but many times you just have to fill in a blank. And sometimes they'll say, what else did you learn? Or what, you know, it's very common, for example, to say, who is the author of this book? Tell something about the author and tell something about him. Tell the author's name and something about him. Um, those kind of things. So he's called John Mark. We call him Mark. He's called John Mark. The name John sometimes goes before his name. John Mark. His mother hosted the Jerusalem church in her home. You need to remember that. And Barnabas was his cousin. Some translations translate that his uncle. And in the Greek, it could possibly be either, if I remember that correctly. But anyway, he's a relative, like an uncle or a cousin. And Barnabas was a leader in the church. So you need to remember those things. I think I've got that slide in there. Twice, maybe. <laughs> um, he wrote primarily to Gentiles. Remember, Matthew wrote primarily to Jewish believers. Mark wrote primarily to Gentiles, explaining Jesus how, how Jesus fulfilled the expectation of the Jewish people. He wrote to encourage believers who were suffering. A lot of New Testament books have part of that as their purpose. They're encouraging believers, encouraging Christians. Mark's gospel was the first to be written. That doesn't mean the first New Testament book. James was probably the first New Testament book. But Mark was the first gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the gospels, remember. And Mark was the first gospel to be written. Early Christians' writings say he was in Rome with Peter at the, when Peter died, when Peter was killed, AD 68. Mark probably wrote his gospel in Rome between 58 and 60. We're not really sure about the dates, and I've told you before, I think it was earlier than that. I think it was probably closer to 50, but we don't know for sure. The theme, Jesus is the servant. Key word there is servant. Jesus is the servant of God. I'm going to mark that. The theme verse, 1045, for even the Son of Man did not come to serve, to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is what the book of Mark is really all about. Jesus came, calls himself the Son of Man. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Unique to Mark. Mark frequently uses the Greek word translated immediately or at once. You see this word a lot in Mark. Immediately, immediately, immediately. We've already seen some verses like that. Mark gives more space to Jesus' suffering and death than the other gospel writers do. Those are some things you could write as, what else did you learn in this, about the book of Mark? What else does Mark tell us? What else did you learn about Mark? Miracles. Jesus' miracles are key events. He stresses the miracles more than the teachings of Jesus. He stresses the miracles of Jesus. That's important to remember. I already said that. Oh, here's something you need to remember. It's, he's the only one to call his writing a gospel. It's in the very first verse. He calls it the gospel. Another thing to remember, Mark wrote what Peter told him to write. Mark and Peter were close, and he wrote what Peter gave him to write down. So Mark's gospel is almost like the gospel of Peter. Peter didn't write it, Mark did, but he used Mark. Mark was really close to Peter. Already said that, primarily to the Gentiles, Church of Rome. 
Don't really talk about that. Don't really talk about that. Don't really talk about immediacy. This writing style, though, you might remember, uh, it's vivid and it's graphic. That'd be a good thing to remember. Vivid and graphic. He wrote about action. Vivid and graphic action book. Jesus' servant, we talked about that. The Messianic secret refers to the fact that several times Jesus said, don't tell anybody about a miracle until, until after I've risen from the dead. Probably to keep the crowds down a little bit because he couldn't conform, perform all his ministry if the crowds came in too big and too, too out of control. So he's, he's trying to keep the crowds down somewhat. So he said, don't tell anybody. But several times he warned people not to tell anybody. Jesus did everything according to perfect timing. Satan was trying to throw off his timing with crowds of people. Even though the crowds of people needed to hear what Jesus had to say, uh, they could get overwhelming. Messianic secret. You need to remember that. <clears throat> Jairus is the one. You need to remember his name. He's the ruler of a synagogue. Jairus, ruler of a synagogue. You need to remember that. And he came out because his daughter was near death, and before Jesus got there, she died. Remember that. We, we read all that last time. But Jesus raised her from the dead. So Jairus is the one that Jesus raised his daughter from the dead, the ruler of the synagogue. You need to remember that. Here's where he raised her from the dead. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. They were immediately overcome with amazement. So you see the word immediately twice there. But this is where he raised that little 12-year-old girl from the dead. You need to remember that. While he was on the way, there was a woman who had a discharge of blood. And this is marked, this is underlined here for use because there'll be some of this on the test. She'd heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. She said, if I can just touch his robe, I'll be healed. If I can just touch his garment, I'll be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up. She was right. She was healed. She felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. So she touched, She was healed by touching his garment. Then the, his own people that knew him in his hometown took offense at him. They thought, why is he acting like a great teacher? He's just Jesus. He's just a carpenter. And Jesus said, a prophet's not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives in his own household. So that's going to be on the test. A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives in his own household. So a lot of times the relatives just felt like, well, this guy couldn't be a prophet. He's a normal, ordinary guy. That's what they thought about Jesus. This is when he fed the, the uh, 5,000 men. He said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Remember, it was a little boys, the other gospel writers tell us, but, but Jesus took those five loaves and two fish and fed 5,000 men. So there were more people than that were there. 5,000 men were there. So, amazing miracle. And then he, t he, he told them, don't you see that whatever goes into a person from outside can't defile him, making... Making him unclean is the word instead of foul. There'll be defile, I think, on the test, but it says make him unclean. So he declared all foods clean. He says food's not going to mess you up. It's okay to eat whatever you want to eat. But, you know, it's not unclean. It's not sinful to eat certain kinds of food. Like it was in the Old Testament. He wanted the Old Testament Jews to keep separate from everybody, so they had to eat certain kinds of food. But now he says, no, you can eat any kind of food now. He said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him or makes him unclean. In other words, the word, the thoughts of your heart, the things that are going on in your heart. He said, that's, that's what messes you up. And he's talking about, about your heart here. So we saw that verse last time. But those two are underlined, which means you can expect to see something from those two on the test. Again, don't, make sure it's not, you don't, don't just look at it and say, okay, I, I, I see it. You got to think about it and maybe write it down. What defiles a man? Well, it's what, not what goes into him; it's what comes out of him. Only he's going to say what makes him unclean. It's not what goes into him; it's what comes out of him. Food doesn't make you unclean. And this is where we got to. Now I want to. Let's see. I got plenty of time. 
I, don't let me forget, this is Chapel Day, and about, by about 10 after, I want to you know, try to stop this class on Chapel Day on Thursday, so help me to keep in mind, 11 forces, we've got 20 minutes, we've got plenty of time here. All right, this is later in his ministry. Bethany's not far from Jerusalem, so he's down in the south part of the place right now, the country. He's in the house of a man named Simon, who was a leper that Jesus had healed. And, he, and Simon apparently has served him, wanted to host in, in his house a big supper for Jesus. And it was partly over his healing. It's also partly over Lazarus is being raised from the dead. And, uh, and Jesus is leaning back at a table. And a woman, we know this is Mary from the other Gospels, came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly. And she broke the flask and poured it over his head. Now that's that's an underlined verse, so there'll be a question about that on the test. So Mary, this woman, came with this alabaster flask, very expensive, kind of fragile flask that you could break, kind of like glass. And, uh, and, and it was, pure nard was, a, was an ointment. It was an expensive perfume, very expensive. And she broke it and poured it over his head. And there were some who said to themselves, what was that wasted for? We learned from other gospel writers, Judas Iscariot started this. He said, that could have been, that money could have been given to the poor. Or you doing poor on Jesus. Uh, so he said, they were saying it's wasted. This woman could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She's done a beautiful thing for me. Do you always have, you always have the, we always have the poor with you. Whenever you want to, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She's done what she could. She's anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she's done will be told in memory of her. That's why God put it in Scripture. That, that, that's fulfilled because everybody that reads this passage of Scripture, Mark is going to know what she did, what Mary did. So what she did is she took something very, very expensive that, that could have been spent on the poor. They were right. But she, she gave it to Jesus instead. She, she anointed Jesus. And he said, she knows that she's, she may not fully understand what she's doing, but she's anointing my body for burial. He knew he was going to die very soon, very soon after this. And she, that was her way of recognizing he is worthy of the most expensive thing I've got. That was the most precious thing she had. She gave it to Jesus. She, she wasted it, quote unquote, on Jesus to honor him, to glorify him. And, and, and there'll be a lot of times when the world won't understand, you know, a lot, you know, most of us Christians give money to the church and the world says, good grief, you could give your money over here and do better or something like that. But, but we give our money to the Lord and do the Lord's work. And some of it does go to help the poor. We believe in helping the poor. You know, usually most churches do some of that. Uh, we help missionaries. We help spread the word. We, we, we pay our pastors and so forth, you know, so uh, we do a lot of good things with the money that God's allows us to have, but it's for Jesus, it's for his glory, and that's what she's doing. She's pouring this out on Jesus to glorify him, to honor him, to say he's worth everything I've got. She just, her life was given to Jesus. That's, what a, that's how a Christian feels. I want Jesus to have everything. It's all about Jesus. Here's another verse that will be on the test. Calling to him his disciples, he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Life's not about us. Not, not, life's not all about us. Before we come to Christ, before we become a Christian, we're all, by nature, very, very selfish. We would all be very selfish. We all tend to be selfish anyway. We all have to fight that. The flesh is weak and tends to be very selfish. And then we come to Jesus and he says, Look, I'm going to forgive you your sin. I'm cleansing you. Uh, I died on the cross. He hadn't yet at this point, but he's going to die on the cross to pay for those sins. And you can, but you can trust me, and I will forgive you those sins. But of course, when we do that, to trust him means we realize who he is. He's God, and he's Lord, and he's in charge. And so my life's all about him now. And he said, you're going to have to be willing to die for me. That's what a cross, he's going to die on the cross. Many of his followers, early Christians, died too. Some of them died, and Peter died on the cross upside down. Um, but, but he said, you've got to be willing to, to give up your life in this world and follow me. 
because of all that I've done for you. And besides, in the next life, you're going to have everything. He says, it's going to be awesome. You know, you don't get hung up on this life only. That's what he's warning us there. And that's a danger for anybody. But we need to make sure we're focusing on Jesus, taking up our cross and following him. For whoever would save his life will lose it. That, that will be on the test. And deny himself, take up his cross and follow him. Whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. He's talking about eternal life here. We're going to have eternal life. So losing your life in this world is very small. What's it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? You can have the whole world. And if you lose your soul, that's not going to last very long. If you, if you live to be a really, really old person, 100 years old, uh, you're going to die. And when you do, it doesn't matter what you had here in this world. All that matters is eternity. What can a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. In other words, if you're really trusting Jesus, if you know who he is, you can't keep that a secret. You're not going to say, oh, I don't want to talk about Jesus. I'm not going to talk about Jesus. I'm too ashamed. I'm too embarrassed. That doesn't make sense, he says. If you realize who I am, you won't be ashamed of me. I'm your Lord. I'm the one that saved you. I'm the one that forgave your sins. I'm the one that gave you an eternal life. So you're not going to be ashamed of me. You're going to want to honor me and glorify me in this world and you'll receive eternal life in the life to come. Um, I'm going to skip through this. I may come back in a minute, but I want to make sure I get all these covered. See, this is underlined here where he broke down and wept. This is talking about Peter. Uh, Jesus told Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And, 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 uh, and Peter did do that. And when that happened, uh, he cried. He broke down and he wept. And that's going to be on the test. And then when Jesus was being, right before his crucifixion, when he was being tried by the Sanhedrin, the, the Jewish priests and all those important Jewish leaders, the high priest, Jesus said, I'm, I, well, let me back up a little bit farther. The high priest said, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power coming with the clouds of heaven. And when the high priest heard that, he tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You've heard the blasphemy. So he said, we, we wanted some witnesses so we could put him to death, but we don't need any witnesses now. We've heard him with our own ears. He's guilty of blasphemy. Now, he really wasn't, of course, because he really was God. <laughs> so he's just telling them who he really was. But he's saying, Jesus is blaspheming because they didn't think he was God, so they just decided to kill him. So the high priest said those words. You need to remember that. Uh, another thing you need to remember from on this test, they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. That, that will be on the test. It's underlined. So it'll be on the test. The soldiers put a purple cloak on him, making fun of him, acting like he was a king of some kind. And he really was the king, but they were pretending knowing they're going to crucify him, that he was a king, of an earthly king. Gave him a crown, but it was thorn, so they're making fun of him. Ridiculing him and hurting him in the process. And then this, after Jesus died, there was a centurion there uh, who saw the whole thing happen. And he saw the way he breathed his last. He said, truly this man was the son of God. There's a centurion recognized this, this is not a normal, normal man. This is not the way people, normal people die. Of course, when he died, the, temple, the, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus said, it is finished. And he finished what he came to do to pay for men's sins. And the centurion recognized this has to be the Son of God. He's not just an ordinary man. This is also going to be on the test. There were women looking on from a distance. This is when he was crucified, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. So, these women, Mary, Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. James and the younger and Joseph are two brothers. This is not James, the brother of John. This is a different mother. But uh, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger, and Salome were another, was another woman who was with them. And they followed him. And uh, they were watching him crucified.
after he was crucified, uh, <clears throat> it was, I'm going to say to get into this because of the time, but there, there were two Sabbaths that week. There was an annual Sabbath that was a Passover Sabbath. Every, every year, the Jews celebrated Passover on Nisan 15th. It's the 15th day of the month. The 16th day, I'm sorry, Nisan 14th. And the 15th day was the first day of unleavened bread, and it was an annual Sabbath. He was, he was, die, he was crucified on Passover, so there was an annual Sabbath that day. And then there was the regular weekly Sabbath that day on Saturday. And, uh, and so he was, he was about to be the regular weekly Sabbath. He'd been crucified. And they said, we, we want to get his body down. So Joseph of Arimathea, who was a respected member of the council, which is really strange, he realized who Jesus was. He was trusted, he was kind of like Nicodemus. Uh, he, was, he was also looking for the kingdom of God. Joseph of Arimathea, he was looking for the kingdom of God. He got his, got his courage up and he went to Pilate and asked, give me the body of Jesus. So Pilate was surprised Jesus was dead, but he's going to send a centurion out to push a spear in his side, and he really did decide he's dead. So he let Joseph of Arimathea take him and bury him in his own tomb. So Joseph took the body of Jesus off the cross and buried him in his own tomb. So you need to remember Joseph of Arimathea and what he did. Finally, Mary Magdalene, you remember her name. She was there when they crucified him. And then early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Now we learned, we learned this from the other gospels as well. But she's the first one he came to, he appeared to after he rose from the dead. She came early, early on Sunday morning, before light, before daylight, and Jesus appeared to her. She saw the tomb empty, the stone rolled back, the tomb empty, and Jesus appeared to her. And she ran back and told Peter and John. They came back and found it empty. Meanwhile, Jesus actually greets Mary and talks to her personally after his resurrection. So she's the first one to know that he was really risen from the dead. Okay, now those are the things that will be on the test. Now, in the few minutes that I've got left, I want to go back and talk about two or three more things, maybe. Uh, some of this I've probably talked about enough. Do you have any questions about anything you've marked or anything I've talked about the test? You, you understand the test will be next time. You know what to study now, right? You, got it. you, you just don't need to learn those things. Take it seriously. I talked about this plenty. Um, talked about that plenty. Talked about Peter denying Jesus. It's interesting. <clears throat> This, this is before they, before they actually send him to be crucified. They're having a fake trial. They weren't supposed to have a trial after sunset like this. It was in the night. They weren't supposed to do that. That was illegal. Uh, the trial was illegal on lots of bases for lots of reasons. It was a false trial. They were just trying to get rid of Jesus. But they were looking for people to give a testimony against Jesus, but they couldn't find anybody because he had nothing wrong. They got false witnesses, but their testimony didn't agree, so they couldn't use them. And then some said, well, we've heard him say, I'll destroy this temple that's made with hands. In three days, I'll build another not made with hands. And of course, he's not talking about Herod's temple. He's talking about his body. You know, he said, I'm going to destroy this temple, this, this, his body. Our bodies are called temples. Well, our bodies are called temples, too. He said, I'm going to raise, raise it back up. I'll rise again. <clears throat> Yet even at this, the temp their testimony didn't agree. And the high priest stood in the midst and said, have you no answer to make? Now, this is interesting. What is these men testified against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. So at first, Jesus refused to answer. That was prophesied in the book of Isaiah. Uh, Matthew talks about that, but Isaiah 53 says, you know, he, like a sheep before her shivers is done, so he opened not his mouth. He didn't speak a word in his defense, but he did tell them who he was. He just, he just kept silent which is amazing. He kept silent before Pilate, too, and Pilate was just amazed. Said, don't you know what's happening here? You're about to be crucified. Don't you want to speak in your defense? But he never did. But he did tell him who he was. The high priest said, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. That, by the way, is the great God is called the great I am. The main name for God is Jehovah or Yahweh, and it literally means I am. I'm the existing one. I just have existed from eternity past. I exist to eternity future. I just always exist. And Jesus is that God. Jesus says, I am. I'm Jehovah. I'm Yahweh. And he said, no to that. You'll see the Son of Man, talking about himself, 
seated at the right hand of power, the right hand of God, and coming with the clouds of heaven. <clears throat> so he said, you, you'll see sooner or later that I am who I said I am. Jesus said, you'll see one of these days. I'm, I'm the son of God. And the high priest tore his garments. Well, I saw this, you know, said, well, this, this is blasphemy. But it wasn't blasphemy, it was the truth. Pilate, very, very sad character in the Bible. He had a lot of power, humanly speaking. He thought he did. But he wanted to release Jesus because he knew he was innocent. And they said, no, we, we, won't, we, don't, we don't want you to crucify him. He said, what do I do with this man? You call king of the Jews. They said, crucify him. They said, release Barabbas. You know, let, you know, they, he said, I'm going to release one guy for you. He said, release Barabbas, not Jesus. Pilate said, why? What evil has he done? Pilate knew he hadn't done anything. They just shouted, crucify him. It was just like a mad mob. They're not telling him what he did wrong. This is what he did. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released them Barabbas. Having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, the governor's headquarters. They called together the whole battalion. <clears throat> they closed, now I read this part. Now, this is sad because Pilate knew he was innocent. Pilate could have said, there's no way I'm going to crucify this innocent man. I'm going to let him go. He did the, the people would probably crucify themselves. I don't know they didn't have the authority to do it. But, but Pilate wanted to satisfy the crowd. That's the sad part right here. Pilate wished to satisfy the crowd. He wanted to keep people happy. And we find ourselves sometimes struggling with that, don't we? We want people to be happy. <laughs> and sometimes if our friends don't like the fact that we're standing firm as a Christian, we may be tempted to compromise just to try to keep people happy. That's a wrong decision. you got to be willing for some people to be unhappy. You've got to be willing for some people to not like you or not like your decision to stand firm for Jesus. And that's, that's where Pilate was weak, very weak. They mocked him, just like the Old Testament prophesied. Psalm 22 prophesied this, all this stuff. They led him away to be crucified. Read that. I'll say one more thing about this. So Pilate gave Joseph of Arimathea the body of Jesus. He said, you can, you can take the body. Once the centurion made clear he was dead, he granted the corpse to Jesus, uh, to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb then cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. <clears throat> now, let me tell you how they did that. They would take these linen cloths and wrap a dead body in it. They had something they called myrrh, M-Y-R-R-H. It was, it was considered a valuable substance back then. It, was, it had a perfume about it. And of course, dead bodies weren't embalmed. The Jews didn't embalm their bodies, so they buried them very quickly. They never, they, you know, well, sometimes today, it's getting more common for people to be buried more quickly today to here too, but not everybody gets embalmed. But, but many, many people today, the, the body is embalmed after this person dies, which means it will last for a few days before it starts to decay. It doesn't decay immediately. Uh, but they didn't do that. And what they would do to take, keep down the smell when a body died is put those, that myrrh in there with those claws. And myrrh, have you ever gone through the woods and touched a pine tree and got pine rosin on your hands? And it's really, really sticky. You know what I mean? That myrrh was like that. It was, a, it, was a, it was a substance that came from a tree. And it would stick those gray clothes to the body and stick those gray clothes together. So do you remember at one point, Peter and John, when Mary Magdalene came back, Mark doesn't tell us about this, but the other Gospels do, John does. When Mary uh, Magdalene came, came running from the tomb, the, the tomb was empty, and she came running to the disciples, and she found John and Peter and the other disciples, and she said, the tomb's empty. They've taken away his body. I don't know where he is. And they ran down to the tomb. Peter and John did. When they got down there, they looked in, and they saw these garments. Remember that? They saw these, these, these claws lying there, these burial claws. And, and John says, when I saw it, I believed. Because they knew that if somebody's going to come steal Jesus' body, they wouldn't take the cloths off because it would be all sticky. It just, they'd take the whole thing. If you're going to steal a body for some reason, you'd take the grave clothes too. If you're going to take the grave clothes off, it would have been a big mess of cloth mixed in with that sticky stuff, that, that myrrh. So it, they're all neat. Just, just kind of like a cocoon left behind. Jesus had risen out of, the, out of those 
grave clothes. He, he was risen from the dead. And John said, when he saw it, he said, I knew the truth. So they, it wasn't long after that until Jesus appeared to them. But that's, that's for the significance of those grave clothes. Pretty, pretty important. Um, very early on the first day of the week, we didn't read this part. The sun had risen. They went to the tomb. So Mary Magdalene had already been there once, but there now she's coming with these other women. It says, who rolled the, the, some of the women are saying, who rolled away the stone? The stone was rolled back, very large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, don't be alarmed. You're seeking Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? But go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. But it goes on and talks about the fact that eventually, of course, they did tell the disciples and, and the disciples were afraid too. They were afraid that, that, that they, they thought for first that maybe somebody had stolen his body and they thought they, they killed him. They're going to kill us too. And they were, they were hiding in a room. But Jesus appeared to them and he said, look, I, I've, I've conquered death now. You can, you can see where the scars are. It's, me, it's really me. And I've risen from the dead, and you're going to rise from the dead too, so you don't have to be afraid anymore. So anyway, Jesus took away their fear, and from there on they were very, very bold and courageous. He rose from the dead, most important miracle in the world. Okay, I'm going to stop right there and let you go. Do you have anything else you need to say? Father, thank you so much for Mark and using Mark and Peter to write down these, this account of the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And Lord, I thank you that he is alive. I thank you that Jesus didn't stay dead. I thank you that Jesus conquered death and you had plenty of eyewitnesses there uh, to see him alive so that we can know for certain that he really did do what he said he did. So we thank you that we worship you, a risen Lord, a risen Savior. We glorify you. We thank you that one of these days you're going to raise our bodies back from the dead too. And we thank you for that, Lord. We just want to praise you well, worship you well until you call us home. So thank you for this opportunity to do that. Pray for chapel today that you'd bless uh, uh, the chapel speaker, uh, Dawson, I believe. And I pray you'd cause it to go well and just glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen.